Ladies and gentlemen, mesdames et messieurs, chers amis, my name is Mathias Rambeau and I work at the head of the book department here at the French Institute and I'm delighted to hosting the sixth edition of the Beyond World Festival here at the French Institute in the United Kingdom. We are missing one guest but she will come a bit later. Marie Dariussec is uh, delayed, she's still in the Euro Star but she will be at 7.30, she should be here so no worries. <laughs> Um, literature is nothing but words on a piece of paper. This speech is full of words and yet it is not literature. What makes words on paper become literature is a mystery. And one of the ways to investigate this mystery is to share a moment with those very people through whom this mystery happens. So tonight, for this talk entitled The Writing Life, we are utterly pleased and honored to welcome four very talented artists. Deborah Levy is a British playwright, novelist, and poet. She's the author of beautiful and haunting novels such as Hot Milk or Swimming Home, and of an innovative and critically acclaimed memoir, Things I Don't Want to Know, The Cost of Living, and Real Estate. She has also written for the Royal Shakespeare Company and is a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature. In France, she won the Prix Féminin Étranger in 2020 for her books published by Les Éditions du Sous-Sol in Céline Leroy's translation. She will be joined a bit later by French writer, art critic and translator Marie Dariussec. Her debut novel, Pig Tales, was translated into 35 languages. She has won numerous prizes for her prolific literary work, including the Prix Médicis and the Prix des Prix for her novel, Men. Her latest publication in English, Crossed, Line, Crossed Lines, sorry, was translated by Penny Houston and published by Text Publishing in 2021. Lauren Elkin will chair tonight's discussion. Lauren is a Franco-American writer and translator whose book, Flanners, Women Walk the City, was a Radio 4 Book of the Week and a New York Times Notable Book of 2017. Her latest work, number 91-92, Notes on the Parisian Commute, was published by Les Fugitives in 2022. And last but not least, Felicity de Jeu will read some passages from both Mary's and Deborah's books tonight. Felicity has worked extensively as an actress in both France and England, Known for a recurring part in the BBC Waking the Dead, her career has ranged from playing Catherine in Henry V at the National Theatre to acting in films such as Casino Royale. I would like to thank Nikki Boltz from Text Publishing for allowing us to read some exclusive passages from Penny Houston's English translation of Mary's latest book, Pas Dormir. And I would also like to thank Florence and Vincent Gombeau for their continued support for this festival. After this talk, Deborah and Marie will be happy to send copies of their books available downstairs, thanks to our partnership with La Page and South Kensington Bookshop. But please don't hold them back too long during the book signing, because at 8.20 sharp, they will have to go to our Cine Lumière to introduce the screening of Audrey Diwan's film happening. Thank you, and now, Lorraine, the floor is yours. Merci, Mathias, and thank you, everybody, for coming out here tonight. Thank you to the French Institute for hosting us. Um, we are going to, you know, be sitting here with bated breath, waiting for Marie to arrive. We'll see how long it takes her to get from St. Pancras to um, here in South Kensington. Uh, I don't know. We could take bets on how long it's going to take, but that might put too much pressure on her. Um, but anyway, I'm very happy to be here with my good friend Deborah, and we're going to just talk about her work for a bit, and then when Marie joins us, we'll enlarge the discussion to include her. Um, and I think Félicité will, will do us the honor of reading a bit of Deborah's work to start with, and then when Marie is here, um, Félicité will read from Marie's work. So when I was asked to do this event, I said yes, like within a second of, of opening the email. Um, these are two writers whose work has impacted me and marked me, um, challenged me, made me think, made me a better writer, um, and I'm just so honored to be in at least one of their presences tonight and soon. <laughs> Both of their presences. Can you say that? Presences? Um, 
I read them into a kind of anti-tradition of the feminist avant-garde that includes Marguerite Duras, whose work both of them have engaged with on quite a profound level, Virginia Woolf, Louise Bourgeois, Francesca Woodman, Paula Rego, Angela Carter, but their voices and their visions are really like no one else's. They take these influences from, you know, all that have marked so many of us, but they really kind of metamorphose them into something that is uniquely their own. Um, and so, yeah, the, some of the sort of general thematics that I was hoping to talk about tonight, it's, I feel bad talking about this with Marie, not here to hear about it, but you know, when she gets here, I'll just lob some of these questions at her. Um, but it have to do with psychoanalysis, which is super important to both of them, um, and to surrealism, uh, to the body, to feminism, to geopolitics, to the climate emergency. It's quite a lot to get through in you know, what is actually a pretty short event, but these are some of the, I wanted to sort of sketch out the immense range that both of their books um, engage with and, and project us out into and sort of the depth of the, the subjects that they, they um, urge us to consider or bring us to consider. Um, so yeah, speaking for myself as someone who moved to London about six months ago, I find that everyone here, or at least the people that I talk to, have two, two topics of conversation. The first is preschools and the second is real estate. So. <laughs> Deborah, I wonder if we could get started just by talking about how you came to frame this final um, installation of your living autobiography within the conceit or the device or the metaphor of, of real estate. Yes, sure. Um, <clears throat> so because I write in the present tense, I think I'm going to speak to the present tense of the empty chair. Um, I, I'm writing a play in my mind where... Uh, a speaker doesn't turn up, and um, and something will happen. So you know, if we need if we need proof that absence is as interesting as presence, there it is. Uh, real estate. So it's a, an American term, um, and um, the words have always played and uh, have always sounded quite strange in my mind. Real estate. And uh, when I've been in America and I've seen, seen these, these signs, um, real estate um, seemed interesting to play with. So I'm working in the final trilogy with Virginia Woolf's A Room of One's Own, with uh, Marguerite Duras's Practicalities, where she writes so brutally and exquisitely about home. Um, and I'm going to just read, actually, a small passage from Duras because it was so important. So the English translation is Practicalities. And this is called House and Home. Now, even that, is quite subversive because these are supposed to be, these are mocked feminine subjects, apparently, they gendered subjects. I don't know why, because architects make all kinds of um, public buildings, okay? Uh, but house and home is a, um, there, there would be uh, people sneering at those two, those two words. We have to remember that when Wolf wrote to the Lighthouse, it was reviewed in America as domestic psychology. As much as anything else, it was a book about war. A house means a family house, a place specially meant for putting children and men in so as to restrict their waywardness and distract them from the longing for adventure an escape they've had since time began. The most difficult thing in tackling this subject is to get down to the basic and utterly manageable terms in which women see the fantastic challenge a house represents, how to provide a center for children and men at one and the same time. The house a woman creates is a utopia. She can't help it can't help trying to interest her nearest and dearest, not in happiness itself, but in the search for it. 
So some of that I agree with, some of it I don't, but I like that idea of, um, in a way, splitting from your own happiness and creating, being the architect of everyone else's happiness, um, which is a very generous, um, a very generous task for anyone sort of creating a home. So I'm wanting to expand and subvert the gendering of, of, of home. On the other hand, um, I wanted to look at real physical longing for a home, not just for a room of one's own, because what are we talking about when we talk about home? So many things, okay. But, um, but for real estate, I'm talking about feeling comfortable in the world. And the home is a world that we can design and create. It doesn't have to be grand. It can be humble. But we, we design it, even if it's just putting two chairs, one there and one there, and working out where we want to sit in it and, and, and the mood we want to create in it. So if you, if you feel that you don't have a stable place in the world, home um, is a way of um, creating something, some peace, and inviting others. This is very important, inviting others to it. Lots of fantasies of real estate. So uh, there's a sort of joke in the book about a, um, a property portfolio. And all the fantasies that I'm sure many of you have, you've designed the homes that you, the fantasy homes that you've put into your property portfolio. And because it was the last book, sorry, it's such a long, long um, answer. Um, I was looking at what women might inherit, um, discard, um, how we measure value, um, all, all of those things. Then, if patriarchy is the mansion um, on the land, does that mean that women are its sitting tenants, that we've sort of settled on, you know, every tenants on the land. There's that as well. And finally, um, the idea that my books are my real estate. They are my properties. And um, so that's another way of measuring and this is, this is, th those are some of the many things mm. in real estate. Um, it's, thank you for that, by the way. And je t'en prie, like, go on for as long as you like. This is, you know, we're here to, to sit at your feet and bask in your glory. So, you know, please, please ramble. Um, that wasn't, not that that was rambling, but that's an invitation to ramble. Um, but I'm really interested that you read that bit from, um, from Practicalities, because I think, if I'm remembering correctly, that you cited that in Things I Don't Want to Know, which is the first of the three living autobiography books. So I wonder if you, if you could say a bit about how Duras's vision has sort of shaped the three books, or how, how you've structured them, why this is the natural conclusion, or how the idea of home kind of evolved over the three books. Mm. Now I'm rambling. Um, well, home's in all three books. Um, uh, the cost of living is about the breakup of a family home and, and then making another composition. I really like that term, composition. You know, I, I, I want to find other language for these very old themes as they've been told to us. So to make a new composition is incredibly encouraging to me. And I, I, there's some people nodding here, and that I, I love that because. Um, it's not really about making a, a, a new home. It's about composition with all its complexities. And the whole world needs a new composition, actually, um, at the moment. You know, I, I feel really sickened at this moment in history. 
by the same old, same old composition. I want to erase that house. I want to topple it. And we need to, we need to build something new. But sorry, what was your question? <laughs> I guess just how home evolves is a concept across the three books, and you know, I just think it's so, it's so wonderful that you s that that quote features in things I don't want to know, and yet tonight we're here to talk about the conclusion of the series with real yes. estate, and it's still what you want to be quoting and talking about. Yeah, well, um, I think it's what all my work, in in a sense, is about. Uh, when I began the the trilogy. I, um, I wanted to create an intimate voice and a formal voice because it's not a conversation in a bar. Um, so that was hard to do because, because they were written in the first person. I wanted to create a um, protagonist who is something like myself, who isn't fixed and certain, who doesn't go striding into the world with her certainties and opinions. Hello. Hello. Bonjour. Hello. Hello. Welcome. <laughs> welcome. Welcome. Are you okay? I'm okay. I'll be okay. okay. Can, I, can I pour you your drink? It's okay. Don't worry. So we 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 having a conversation now about uh, writing in the first person, trying to um, create a um, trying to steer three books in the first person with a, shall we say, narrator who's a little like myself, who is porous, who is full of holes, so the world falls into her. Okay, she's not one subjectivity. There are, there are many. Now, I know this sounds very obvious, but it's incredibly hard to do because what's the point of kind of um, writing books in which um, you, you're going to prove that you're right. You're going to steer everything to support, slyly support your arguments. It's not like I don't do that either, by the way. Um, you know I don't. But to create a, um, a porous eye, it was really interesting to me. I learned a lot, a lot about writing a lot about the world um, in my attempt to do that. And that's the voice that steers all three. And so home is going to come into all three. And, um, and I'm going to subvert um, a gendered home and call it a composition. That's about it. Um, there's a great passage, a whole kind of chapter, where you talk about your friend Celia, who we all will remember from The Cost of Living, whose shed you were writing in for a while. And now she's selling her house and you have to work in a different shed, but you still hang out with Celia. And now you're reading Leonora Carrington's wonderful novella, The Hearing Trumpet. And there's this great quote, I can't remember if she reads it out loud or if you're just quoting it, uh, where Carrington writes, houses are really bodies. Yes. Um, I wonder, I mean, you, you quote from Bachelard quite a bit in this book, who himself writes about houses as very bodily. I think he writes about the rooms of a house as being like the cells of our lungs, um, the air sacs in our lungs. Mm. So I don't know if you want to say a bit more about the bodiliness of the house. Yes. I decided not to, I decided just to quote um, the bodiliness body less of the house. Um, because it's been written about in those terms excellently, and I didn't think I had anything to add. So you, you kind of, um, with Celia, I, I suppose my intention there was to show how you have to invent life over and over and over again. So she's, she's 80, and she's trying to find a way of doing that phase in her life that's already been written for her. Everyone knows that. And she is trying to rewrite it in, 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 in the way that she's organized care, the way she's organized her animals. Um, I think, in, in my mind, I, I, I'll never forget the image of a very discourteous older person lying in bed 
slide. To I think we're on again. A little slide was attached to the bed so that her dog could um, get up because the dog was blind. The, the dog was blind and happy and Celia had full vision and was miserable. But th th these were the jokes that we, we, we told each other. And, um, and the two cats, and she'd say to me, um, that the carers would say, these cats have to go, the animals have to go. And she'd say, <laughs> she'd say they're the only fucking reason I'm alive. <laughs> that seemed worth writing about. And then one more question before I, I pass it over to Felicity, Felicité, pardon. Um, because I, this, this bodiliness of the house, I think, I just realized as I was sitting here, this is a totally separate question, but something, and this isn't even a fully formed question yet, so I'm sorry, I'm that person who has more of a comment than a question. Um, but something that really struck me on this reading, and this is not the first time that I read it, was the way you, you're working so, you're adhering so clo closely to kind of metaphors or images of interiority. So like there's the egg-shaped fi fireplace, the pomegranate tree, and then there's that quote, I think from Rilke, that's another point of contact with Marie's work, um, where you say there is another world, but it is inside this one. And then there's a line where you talk about how our babies are always inside of us. Even when they're our, our babies, our children are always inside mm. of us, or we're still inside in some way in our mother. So there's all there's this whole kind of game of imagery in terms of things being inside of other things, and that real estate kind of underlines that. I don't know. That's that's something that I, that struck me really forcefully on this reading that hadn't before. And I wonder if that's related to this idea of the house as bodily, or the house as a body that holds us. It holds everything. Um, we make of it what, what we will. Um, I'm, I'm also talking about, just to segue a little bit, being exhausted by fantasy. You know, that, that there's so much imagined real estate in this book. What, what about that? Why, why, what are we gonna do about that? Um, so, Yes, obviously, um, that I am and the female protagonist, there's this lovely split, you know. Sometimes I just go the narrator because it makes it a little bit separate from, from myself. Um, she's, designing, she's designing a way of feeling perhaps easier in the world, living more easily because the world's brutal. Um, and it's about living in patriarchy, which is a very unfashionable word at this moment, but it seems a very apt word, considering historically where we are um, at this moment um, with war. What, what's that about? So, you know, um, where houses are being erased, whole cities are being erased. So I guess my point is, we have to knock down, um, not, not in the sense that I've just mentioned, that real estate we, we, there's real estate that we build, and I mean a new composition in life, and there's, there's a lot that we, we need to let go um, and walk away from and demolish. Thank you. Okay, Felicity, if you want to come up. Actually, I had no idea what serenity felt like. Serenity is supposed to be one of the main characters in old-fashioned femininity's cultural personality. She is serene and she endures. Yes, she is so talented at enduring and suffering, they might even be the main characters in her story. It was possible that femininity, as I had been taught it, had come to an end. Femininity as a cultural personality was no longer expressive for me. It was obvious that femininity as written by men and performed by women was the exhausted phantom that still haunted the early 21st century. What would it cost to step out of character and stop the story? There were many variations, of course. 
including corporate femininity, in which women with male bosses were still required to dress in a way that gave a nod to the boardroom and the bedroom. How is it possible to be erotically and commercially switched on for your boss all the time? That sort of femininity does not wear very well. After a while, it starts to show the dirt. My friend Sasha, who is financially thriving, had told me that on Fridays, she and her female work colleagues ended the week by getting blind drunk in various bars and vomiting all over their corporate uniforms. I thought Sasha and her friends were late capitalism's version of the Menads, female followers of Dionysus, also known as the Raving Ones, except they were bull helmets and could tear up sturdy trees when intoxicated. In 5th century BC Athens, their bodies were imaginatively possessed by various gods. Sasha pointed out that in the 21st century, her body was imaginatively possessed by her various male bosses who insisted wearing high heels and short skirts to work was incredibly empowering. No, there were not that many women I knew who wanted to put that phantom of femininity together again. What is a phantom anyway? The phantom of femininity is an illusion, a delusion, a societal hallucination. She is a very tricky character to play and it is a role, sacrifice, endurance, cheerful suffering, that has made some women go mad. This was not a story I wanted to hear all over again. It was time to find new main characters with other talents. En fait, j'ignorais totalement à quoi ressemblait la sérénité. La sérénité était censée être l'un des personnages principaux de la féminité tel que la culture la définissait autrefois. Elle est sereine et endurante. Oui. Elle est si douée en matière d'endurance et de souffrance que ses caractéristiques pourraient même être les personnages principaux de son histoire. Peut-être que la féminité, ainsi qu'on me l'avait appris, était arrivée à son terme. La féminité, en tant que personnalité culturelle, n'exprimait plus rien pour moi. Il était évident que la féminité telle qu'elle était écrite par les hommes et jouée par les femmes était le fantôme épuisé qui continuait de hanter le début du XXIe siècle. Qu'en coûterait-il de sortir de son rôle et de mettre un terme à ce récit Il existait beaucoup de variations, bien sûr, dont la féminité d'entreprise, où les femmes avec patrons de sexe masculin se retrouvaient encore à devoir s'habiller d'une façon qui convienne à la salle de réunion autant qu'à la chambre à coucher. Comment peut-on se donner en permanence érotiquement et commercialement pour son patron Ce type de féminité ne tient pas bien la route. L'usure finit par se voir. Mon ami Sacha, qui gagnait très bien sa vie, m'a raconté que chaque vendredi soir, ses collègues femmes et elle terminaient la semaine en allant se saouler dans différents bars, puis vomissaient leurs tripes vêtues de leur tailleur d'entreprise. Je me suis dit que Sacha et ses amis étaient une version capitaliste tardive des Ménades, les disciples féminines de Dionysos, un nom qui signifie aussi les furieuses sauf que ces dernières portaient des casques et pouvaient déraciner des arbres énormes quand elles étaient sous l'emprise de l'alcool. Dans l'imaginaire de l'Athènes du 5e siècle avant Jésus-Christ, leur corps était possédé par différents dieux. Dans l'imaginaire du 21e siècle, a remarqué Sacha, leur corps était possédé par différents patrons qui répétaient que porter des talons hauts et des jupes courtes au travail c'était prendre le pouvoir. 
Non. Je ne connaissais pas tant de femmes désireuses de réveiller le fantôme de la féminité. Qu'est-ce qu'un fantôme, de toute façon Un mirage Une hallucination collective C'est un personnage retort à jouer et un rôle sacrifice, endurance, souffrance joyeuse qui a rendu certaines femmes folles. Ce n'était pas une histoire que j'avais envie d'entendre encore une fois. Il était temps de trouver des nouveaux personnages principaux possédant d'autres talents. Merci, Félicité. Um, so, hi, Marie. How are you feeling up to hi, Lauren. chatting? I'm so sure. sorry you had this awful delay. It's I've right. been there. Um, it's a nightmare. Um, But yeah, so something that's so great, I think, about the way that maybe this is an accidental, you know, result of, of programming the two of you in conversation together is that, you know, Deborah's book is, of course, called Real Estate. But in reading Cross Lines, which I think is the book that we're sort of focusing on, but although I have questions for you about lots of, lots of your books, um, it, the idea of real estate is, is, th is there quite, like, prominently. It's not the main thing in the book, but it comes in as a very important kind of, you know, beam of light into this the, con the situation of the book, I guess, which deals with other thematics. So I wonder if you want to talk about a, a bit about real estate and cross-lines. Yeah, yeah, thank you for the question. Yeah, when I read Real Estate by Deborah Levy, I, I connected very strongly. I connect to her. We, we call them the les, les livres, le rouge, le jaune et le bleu in France. We call them by their <laughs> color. So, so I connected to the, the theme, let's say, of real estate, of home, Uh, in my novels, um, I write mostly novels, but in my fiction, sometimes non-fiction, there's always the question of inhabiting, inhabiting this planet. And who has a right to inhabit, and who has a right, and who doesn't have this right? And uh, the novel you're mentioning is, is a novel about the global migration that we all witness. and. Um, And it's the very simple story of a, a, a young, well, young, middle-aged Parisian woman, what we call a bobo. I am a bobo, the, the upper middle class, uh, but uh, struggling with the real estate of Paris, which is crazy, and wondering if yes or no, they will move back to their native region, to Basque country in that case, uh, because it's cheaper and it's nicer, but, but they love Paris too, etc., etc. But the kids could have two rooms, etc. <laughs> and the husband is a real estate agent. And there are always real estate agents in my novels, uh, men, most, and mo real estate agents who are also alcoholic in general, men. <laughs> and um, because they, are, they really have a hard job. I, I interviewed for this novel, it may sound a bit ludicrous, but I, I interviewed a lot of real estate agents in Basque country and in Paris. In the same time, it took me about five years, I, I talked, it wasn't interviews, but I, I met uh, many um, migrants, refugee people, a bit all around the planet, in fact. And uh, I, I wanted their, 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 their lines to cross, in a way. Rose is going to meet and eventually help, a bit against her will, a young refugee. It's very difficult to help somebody. So it's, it's, a, it's a complex novel. And um, Derrida said a wonder, he, Derrida said everything. <laughs> a, a, bit, a, a bit like Roland Barthes or Bachelard is more specific. Yeah. Bachelard really knows what he's talking about. I mean, the other ones they know too. But, but anyway, Derrida <laughs> said, hospitality is improvisation. L'hospitalité, c'est l'improvisation. It's a wonderful sentence. It's a wonderful definition of hospitality. C'est l'improvisation. Myself, I tried to, to, to give a hospitality, to, to give a room, a bedroom, to a very young refugee some years ago. And it's exhausting because you have to improvise all the time. Because the other is the other, and you are the other of the other, and you have to connect in the same, under the same roof with your habits, with his habits, his language, his body language, etc., etc. It's exhausting. It's, it's also 
c'était aussi une expérience très enrichissante. How do you say that in English? It's also a very enriching experience. Okay. <laughs> But it was exhausting. Anyway, I finish. I love real estate agents because when I interviewed them, half of them were squales, des requins. They were just trying to make as much money as possible on the market, you know, on this market and on that market. The Basque market was different from the Parisian market. They were talking in very technical terms that I loved, you know, you can make a novel out of it. The other half of them were saints, saints. They wanted, ils voulaient apparier le bon appartement à la bonne personne. They wanted to make a pair of the right apartment for the right inhabitant. And one of them, I remember, was like an angel because he was talking to me. I, there's something I can't bear, he said. It's, it's a little view that nobody sees. It's a little yard that nobody takes care of. It's, it's a little ceiling that nobody watches. And, <laughs> and he, wanted, uh, the, he wanted the people, he wanted the, the homes to be loved and to be the best shell for, for the inhabitants, like, like those, you know, snails and the seas that, that go from shell to shell, les Bernard Lermite. What's the name of a Bernard Lermite in English? A hermit crab, voilà. So yes, we are talking about real estate and men and, and love and yes. Mm. <laughs> and, and what we do with all of this <laughs> mess <laughs> and the patriarchy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is, this is very, going to be kind of maybe a small thing because we have to get Felicité back up to read from some of your work. But um, s small anecdote, when I was reading Cross Lines, um, the real estate agent, Christian, mentions this apartment in which a woman has, d has been killed at 44 Rue d'Aboukir in, in the second. And I was like, huh, really? So I googled it, and it's actually, a f it's one of those facade buildings. It's not a real <laughs> building. I love that. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's a good reader. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Now, of course, I, I, every every writer puts little tricks, no? In, uh, in, and we, we are delighted to see somebody uh, googling <laughs> and finding the trick. Yes, the the house do, does not exist. It's just a wall. And it's a, a smoke a chimney for the yeah. metro station and uh, an air chimney. But there's this ghost. There's like a ghost in this building. But actually, okay, it's, I, I'll try to be short. But when I interviewed one real estate agent in Paris, he had to sell the studio. It's a horrible story. The studio where a young girl was killed by a very famous French serial killer, Guy Georges. Guy Georges was the, the serial killer when I was young, actually, in the 90s. And we were all very, very scared. We, it was another case of, I'm not going to go out tonight because I'm scared, but that was so real. And the guy killed six young girls, and one of them, the, uh, the apartment went on TV, you know? So it was not possible to sell the apartment mm. because everybody knew that in that place, it had been full of blood and, uh, you know, And eventually, this awful real estate agent, he didn't sold the apartment, he didn't sell it, he rented it to his own young real estate agent colleague who had just arrived in Paris. It's a true story. <laughs> And she didn't know anything about the, 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 the killing, about the apartment, that she had not seen it on TV, etc. The fact is that the real estate agent told me that she couldn't sleep at night because she heard screams and voices Etc. And it got, he got very scared. <laughs> It's a too long story, but I, I didn't use it. Perhaps Deborah, you too, you don't use it. all the things we hear. And uh, so I didn't use that story for my novel. But it's such a good story. Perhaps I will use it. But maybe you agree, Marie, that you, you can't write about home without hauntings. Um, so there is the um, quote from Mark Fisher, the late great essayist: "Home is where the haunt is." Um, and um, it's not that houses are haunted, it's that we haunt, houses haunt us, actually. But that's a whole other, that's a whole other conversation. Um, no, we certainly don't put everything in. That would be terrible. <laughs> so maybe we'll push the pause button on the haunting conversation. If you want to come back to it, we can. And have Felicite come up and read. L'insomniaque est sublime. Seuls dorment les abrutis. 
À peine sait-il s'il dort, dit Proust, de celui qui tombe comme une masse dans son lit. Et Marguerite Duras, sans hésitation. Je crois que l'insomnie débouche sur ce que j'appellerais la grande intelligence. Idem, dans la série des films Matrix, ceux qui dorment sont aliénés. Seuls les héros en éveil voient la fameuse matrice. D'ailleurs, une épidémie d'insomnie les frappe dans Matrice 2. Bref, au bout du désespoir rendu idiot de fatigue. L'ultime refuge de l'insomniaque est de se penser supérieur à ceux qui dorment. C'est Léonard Cohen qui l'a dit. Et il s'y connaissait en nuit blanche. L'insomnie serait donc plus élégante que le sommeil. Seul le héros tragique est insomniaque, constate Roland Barthes. Les serviteurs écoutent les tourments des rois, puis s'en vont roupiller. Les ombres par trois fois ont obscurci les cieux depuis que le sommeil n'est entré dans vos yeux. Les insomnies de Phèdre alarment sa suivante. Mais qui s'inquiéterait des insomnies des nonnes Don Quichotte est debout quand Sancho pensa pionce. Quand arrivait le dimanche, on dormait de fatigue chez les mineurs de Germinal. Mais le vent suffit à tenir en éveil la délicate fille des patrons. Victor Hugo dormait mal. La bataille d'Hernani, on ne peut pas faire plus chic comme cause d'insomnie. Mais Jean Valjean aussi est la proie de l'insomnie. Elle le rend visionnaire jusque dans les égouts et prend la forme d'une tempête sous un crâne d'où il sort grandi. L'insomnie chez Valjean, c'est la conscience même. Elle en oublie l'ancien forçat. Certes, il ne faut pas être bagnard pour deviner qu'on dort moins bien aux galères que chez Diane de Maufrigneuse. Et nous connaissons tous les insomnies de stress ou d'abus, un train à prendre trop tôt qui nous tient aux aguets, un café pris trop tard qui nous laisse exciter. Mais l'insomnie, la vraie, n'a que faire des conditions objectives et traverse toutes les classes sociales. On veille quand il n'y a plus rien à veiller et malgré l'absence de toute raison de veiller, écrit Lévinas, pour qui l'insomnie dans de l'existence à l'existant est du domaine de la métaphysique. Cette insomnie arbitraire traverse la vie humaine avec l'indifférence d'un despote. Sa sentence est tombée. Tu ne dormiras pas. The insomniac is noble. Only idiots sleep. He scarcely knows that he is asleep, says Proust of a man who falls straight into bed night after night. And there are no two ways about it for Marguerite Duras. I think insomnia is a path towards what I would call a higher intelligence. The same idea is in the Matrix movies. Those who sleep are the ones who miss out. Only those who are wide awake, the heroes, can see the famous Matrix, and then they're struck by insomnia in Matrix 2. In short, driven to despair, reduced to idiocy by exhaustion, the last refuge of the insomniac is a sense of superiority to the sleeping world. So said Leonard Cohen, and he knew all about sleepless nights. So insomnia is classier than sleep. Only the tragic hero is an insomniac, according to Barthes. Attendants hear out the story of the king's misfortune, then go off and have a nap. Thrice have the shades of night obscured the heavens since sleep has entered through your eyes, says a nun anxiously to Phaedra. But who is going to worry about Inan's sleepless nights? Don Quixote is awake while Sancho Panza snoozes. And for the miners in Zola's Jamino, when Sunday came, one slept from weariness. But it only takes the wind to keep the delicate Cecile awake. Since sleeping is a nudge almost as vulgar as defecating, It is the will of the aristocrats to usurp the privilege of staying wide awake. One does not sleep when one is as intelligent as I am, 
reflected Count Mosca in the Charter House of Parma. And in Balzac's world, aristocratic women, at best, only rest, while ordinary women collapse from fatigue. Madame Camusot entered the bedroom of the beautiful Diane de Maufrigneuse, who, having retired at one, was still not asleep at nine in the morning. And do poets snore? Insomnia and writing both thrive on the fantasy of the chosen. Victor Hugo slept badly. There's nothing more glamorous than the battle of Hernani to bring on insomnia. But Jean Valjean from Les Miserables also falls victim to insomnia, which bestows visionary powers on him, even in the darkness of the sewers, and manifests itself as a throbbing migraine from which he emerges as a fully-fledged person. For Valjean, insomnia is his very conscience. It ennobles the former convict. Of course, you don't have to be a convict to work out that sleep is more difficult if you're sentenced to hard labor rather than staying at Diane de Maufrigneuse's place. And we all know that form of insomnia brought on by stress or alcohol abuse an early train to catch that keeps us wired, a coffee drunk too late in the day that leaves us agitated. But real insomnia does not care in the slightest about objective causes, and it crosses all social classes. One is vigilant when there is nothing more to be vigilant about, and despite the absence of any reason to be vigilant, wrote Emmanuel Levinas, for whom insomnia belongs in the realm of metaphysics. This random insomnia moves through our lives with the indifference of a despot sentencing us. You will not sleep. Let's see. So um, maybe we can put the two of you back in conversation a little bit more before we invite questions from the audience. I don't know if you wanted to say a bit more about the hauntings and ghostliness. I myself am struck by the kind of persistent presence of, of the uncanny or even the surreal across both of your works. I know you're both like deeply interested in psychoanalysis. Um, so whether you take a more magical realist approach or more psychoanalytic approach to the uncanny, I'd just love to hear if you'd like to discuss. No. I'll lean back. Hello. Um, I enjoyed that very much. I can't wait to read. Why sleep? Why sleep? Mm. It's, it's a good question. <laughs> Are you an insomniac? No. Okay. You're, no. You're lucky, according to me. <laughs> mm. But one of the reasons of no sleeping is the ghosts. Uh, it's the presence of the ghosts, uh, mm. and what we call ghosts is, it could be metaphorical, of course. Mm. In the daytime, I don't believe in ghosts, but at four o'clock in the morning <laughs> when I'm not asleep, I believe in them. I mean, they are here. They are, they are with mm. me. They are in me. They are. And, um, well, it's a long story. Mm. <laughs> Did you sleep better after writing the book? Yes, I'm, I'm a true hysterical, so I need a mm. public. <laughs> so, at the end of the book, when it got published, yes, I did sleep a little bit better. Yes. C'est vrai? It worked. Really? Oui, c'est vrai. Mm -hmm. Ça a un peu marché. C'est mieux. C'est franchement mieux. There's an exorcism. Uh, no. Not even. No, no. Exorcism is too chic. No, it's, it's just that at last I had told everybody that I don't <laughs> sleep and I feel better. <laughs> oh, yeah. Mm. Um, yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> Is there a question? I mean, I think, yes, it's true, the surrealists, mm -hmm. um, the uncanny. Um, the poet is working. Where does that come from uh, uh, to do with sleep? Was that Breton setting up the Bureau of Sleep? Mm. Um, something like that. Such an interesting subject. I mean, so if we, if we, if we segue a little bit, there was a um, sociologist whose name I've forgotten, 
um, who looked at the cleaners at the Garden Or, and she asked them, men and women, how many hours sleep? They had very, very little. And, um, and if you look at early morning trains and, and buses, it'll be full of people who are, who've had very little sleep and who are going on to their second and third jobs. So um, it's, it's always interesting to take something, going back to the body, like we were talking about um, earlier, to construct something else, something yeah, something very interesting. You know, you could really look at sleep, um, as as Marie has done, um, to talk about so many things in the world. And it, when it's centered on the body, um, becomes something something very interesting. The body is left out. I think that's maybe my my rambling point. The body is often um, left out. And it's very difficult to put a body in as a writer because that script is written. Um, so I guess we have to put desire in in all its dimensions. And um, otherwise the book's kind of depressed. But there seems to be a very kind of literal way of bringing the body into, into writing. So I must just, just talk a little bit about pigtails. Mm -hmm. As it was, uh, you know, the English title, Mari. Um, so I read that when I, I was young. I was blown away by it. And, um, and then I gave it to my daughter. Mm -hmm. She's blown away by it. And I just would like to tell you that. It, it, Thank it's, you. It's, yeah. passed, it's, it's passed through. It's haunting. It's haunting generations mm. who... Um, that's a good haunting, right? No, it's, it's very good news that the book, um, apparently, uh, merci de me l'avoir dit, but apparently um, it, it is very well understood and received by the young generation, and I'm very happy about it. Because just to say a little word about it, when I wrote it in the middle of the 90s, it, it directly came through my experience of a young woman being harassed in the streets, but there was no name street harassment, sexual harassment, there was no name, if you remember. You can't remember. <laughs> and I know you, 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 you wrote a book about walking, and walking as a woman in the street is not at all as walking as a man in the street. And uh, the experience was to be interrupted. It's a very feminine experience to be interrupted. Women are interrupted all the time. They can be interrupted by babies, okay? But mo in, when I was 19 in Paris, I was interrupted by men of all ages, of all classes, so all sorts of men. And I was already writing. I mean, when I was, I, I still, when I walk in Paris, I write, I think, it's important. And any guy could interrupt me. Sometimes it was nice, you know, bonjour, comment ça va? But, uh, what? And it, it, I mean, you, and each time I was trying to explain to a good guy, a friend of mine, uh, you know what happened to me? I, I, was, I was running and a guy told me, salop, or I was sitting in a bar and of course I couldn't stay more than two minutes before somebody, a man, sit with me, etc. And the good guys, they always say, no, you, you imagine, you misheard, no, he didn't want to say that, no, you... Because they don't believe you, c'est comme la physique quantique. L'observation détruit la chose observée. Enfin, dès dès qu'on est accompagné par un type bien, ça n'arrive pas. Bon, <laughs> forcément, parce qu'on est accompagné par un type. Bon, well, anyway. Now, so the book, Peter, is not the story of... It is, in fact, the story of sexual harassment. And she becomes a pig because she's harassed. But anyway, yeah, thank you for mentioning it. Mm. <laughs> I had a friend who told me she was asked to act it out in a class on art and psychoanalysis. And she had a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah. Pass that on. <laughs> um, so I would love to hear if there are questions in the audience. I don't know. Uh, do you, are you going to go around, Matthias, with a. Okay, so just in the first row. <laughs> I got to cheat because I'm at the front. <laughs> so obviously, I'm in awe, and I'm so happy to be here, and it's been amazing. I have a few questions. First is if you do want to press play on how houses haunt us, that would be very interesting. The other is psychoanalysis in your books. 
um, how do you use it? How does it, do you do psychoanalysis on yourself before you write or on the character or that'd be interesting to hear. And then finally, um, as a woman, I probably shelter myself a lot from a lot of the things that I'm told I should be angry about because I don't want to feel angry. Um, but sitting here, I feel brave enough to sort of ask about that. And my question is, what do we do? What do we do about being harassed? What do we do about, you know, the, having to wear heels and short skirts to work? Uh, that's it. Mm. Oh, great questions. I mean, uh, I, think that, I think there's a problem, isn't there, of always having to uh, react. Like, um, and I'm against that. It's not like I'm against suppressing the rage, but it's so much better to make something um, than to always be forced into this position of reacting. Like you've got other things to do. It's like what Mari's saying, you know, I, I, actually I've got a book to write. Um, I don't want to just constantly react. So there's that to take, to think about. I would prefer you to make something and not just, I'm asking impossible things and not to suppress um, the fury that you, that you might feel. So I understand, I really, I think you put that really well. And then there was, Oh, psychoanalysis. Okay, so in my, I, I guess my bookshelves, the, um, the books that I return to um, and love are psychoanalytic theory. I'm just that sort of person. It's how I relax. And, um, and poetry. So I've, I just find it very relaxing to read a lot of theory. But I don't want theory walking through my books with its big, you know, muddy boots. It's not of interest to me in any way that readers know I read a lot of clever books. If anything, it's to disguise that. So you know, that you, you, unless you're having to pass an exam or um, you have um, a desire to, to um, <laughs> just to say, well, you know, I'm just reading some very heavy, complex stuff. Um, well, of course you are. Uh, so, 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 but as a lens on the world, it's a very basic answer. Um, when you write, you have to you have to find backstories for characters, case histories, and you're not going to get too far, even if you don't use them. You need to trace a trace of them. So in Swimming Home, that there are really 10 lines of Josef, a character called Josef's um, backstory. But my God, I have files and files and files on Josef. And I just want to leave a, a trace so that, um, yeah, that, that's what I wanted to do. Um, it's, it's just, for me, the most profound lens on the world. It's, it works for me. Um, you, you know, even... Um, oh, well, I won't, I won't even go there. But uh, those, that, that's, those are the bookshelves that I walk past and, um, and love and sort of... Mm, when, I, when I walk past them. There is this idea that novelists sort of don't read theory, which I just find pathetic. <laughs> well, in, in, in Deborah's books, the, um, there is anger, but everything is transformed by her tone of voice. And as you all know, her tone of, of voice is very specific and it's very tr well translated in French. C'est Céline Leroy? Oui. oui. It's very well translated. Um, so she makes something with her anger, which is, which is enormous, I think. But but it's it goes through this uh, transformation, and it gives a certain tone of voice, humor, irony. But even that is not exactly what we call iron in French. It's a bit. It's, a, it's sort of un pas de côté, a step aside. I don't know. It's a. You'll, you'll make something with your anger, but um, you have to find it. But, but it's, a, it's a very, it's a big issue. Mm. It is. Mm. Yeah. 
Hi, good evening. Um, thank you so much for this great talk. Um, I have a question for Marie. Um, I was uh, very interested to hear you talk about uh, ghosts and absence, and um, I know that uh, you've researched and uh, written extensively about uh, the work of the late Hervé Guibert, who also was um, rather obsessed with ghosts. And uh, I wonder if you could um, speak a little bit about uh, the influence of his ghosts on yours. Hervé Guibert. I have a, a nice story. I, I'm not aware if everybody knows who Hervé Guibert was. He was a, a wonderful writer, French writer, who died very, very early at 33. And he was the first one, apparently, with Aron, but in, in the literature world, in the novel world, he was the first one to publicly say that he was dying of HIV, du sida. And he, he was the center of many scandals. He was beautiful, beautiful, uh, if you Google him like we say today, <laughs> but uh, he was beautiful. And he was a very close friend of Michel Foucault that he calls Musil in many of his novels. And he's one of the inventors of autofiction, but real autofiction. Uh, I'm not going into autofiction now, it would be too long, but. And uh, he said in his, in l'ami qui ne m'a pas sauvé de la vie, that uh, Foucault, Musil, but everybody, it was a key novel, everybody could recognize Foucault, that he was not dead of a cancer, that he was dead of HIV, which caused a big scandal. So to sum up, but he was chiefly a great writer. And uh, the story is that uh, I have three kids, um, and my two elders, are reading, my son is 21 and my second, my daughter is 18. They are reading A l'ami qui ne m'a pas sauvé la vie. It's not that common in the, their generation, though I'm sure Ave Guibert will, go back, will come back. But they're reading him because they try, they both try to, my son especially, tries to invent a new way of being a boy, a new masculinity, as he says, a masculinity not based on the monopolies of violence, not based on domination, etc. I find this generation, I was telling Alexandra, I find this generation wonderful. They are amazing. Of course, Bourdieu, come help me, Bourdieu, come help me. They are the sons of and the daughter of a writer and a very privileged cultural family, etc. Of course, I'm aware of that, Bourdieu, 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 okay. But, 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 but all their friends who are not that privileged are also thinking with them in Paris, how can we invent a new way of being on this planet? How can we invent a new way of being boys and girls and not, not that stupidly binary? And uh, how, for example, when I, when I told my son, so, thinking, so you're a bisexual. Mom, a bisexual, it doesn't exist, bisexual. Nobody says bisexual anymore, you know. So I, I entered into a non-binary world. They taught me so much. Because when I read Hervé Guibert when I was their age, you were heterosexual or homosexual or even perhaps bisexual. But there were, it was a three-dimensional world. And now it's so much more... It, it, the complexity of our world, the complexity of our being with the animals, of our being the, with the trees, of our living in those bizarre cities that we built, etc. Uh, I'm uh, really this generation, if it has time, uh, will will invent a new world. I'm, I'm, it's a bit demag demagogic, peut-être ce que je dis, mais non, je le crois vraiment. I really believe it. So all this, uh, in a way, started with me with Hervé Guibert, and he was the first. I read Flaubert, Balzac, etc. at school. He was the first really contemporain that I read, Hervé Guibert. We'll talk more about him if you want. Stance, you can see me. Hi, thank you so much. This has been such a gift and a privilege to be in your presence or presences. Um, I have a question for Marie, but I think that Deborah, you might have some thoughts as well, thinking specifically about hot milk. Um, but we've you've talked about Bachelard and Durat and um, about inhabiting the world, and I wanted to pose the question of water um, and thinking specifically about cross lines. There's la mer, but also that can be la mer, but then there's, for instance, the fluid that passes between 
the line in the book is like le fluide qui passe entre les deux peaux, so between Rose and between between Rose and her son or Eunice or um, so I want yeah I wanted to just hear your thoughts on that. Thank you. Water. Yes. Okay. Um, wa water is um, is in all my books, fiction and non-fiction, uh, as are the trees and the animals. They are in all of my novels and fiction forever. Um, where do we start with water? <laughs> I was born by the Atlantic Ocean, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> my father taught me to swim in the waves. Um, also, what, what I what I can say is that um, uh, an another anecdote uh, of my 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 young my my youth in Paris uh, when I when I was um, a student I, I I belonged to some clubs etc and I wanted to found a club to let's say save the animals and it was in the 90s it was uh, 91 exactly and everybody laughed at me. Really, it was at the Ecole Normale Supérieure. The Ecole Normale Supérieure was very, how can I describe it? It was like uh, like Oxford. It was very, and at that time, um, all these really intelligent kids, uh, they wanted to save the world, which meant um, uh, better uh, protection for the workers, equality, m m m um, better wages. Um, Fighting fascism, fighting Jean-Marie Le Pen, uh, fighting uh, le revisionism. There was this big movement of revisionism, horrible. Um, a little part was equality between men and women, but really a little part we were excusing ourselves. I didn't dare, in my very first interview, it's online, my, one of my daughters showed it to me. And I was ashamed because I, I start, I'm 27, and I say, je ne suis pas féministe, mais... <laughs> because I don't dare. I, Je, je n'ose pas. I'm, I'm afraid to scare who? I don't know. But and anyway, so the, the wanting to save the animals, uh, it was completely ridiculous. It, it was not taken seriously at all. I know this country has a little, a history a little bit different that you took animals seriously a bit earlier than us. But but now now yes yes we can hear intelligent things about the animals. We can speak about them intelligently. We can behave more intelligently with them, and I can say I'm a vegetarian without being mocked less than before. Let's say, so it, it's getting different. Water has a, a, a profound connection with all all that I'm saying. Deborah. Yes. Yeah, so I, I can't speak abstractly about water, but we are made from water, so we are watery things. And in fact, I've written a piece called "Watery Things." That um, that I won't talk about now, but here in real estate, I, I, I just talk about swimming. Um, the Aegean is the sea of the gods. It is ambrosia. It is friendly and it is luscious, like being held by a body that is not too clinging and not too detached. It washes from me the pain of thwarted hope for enduring love, connects me with my mother who taught me to swim, calms my fear about the future, takes the edge off the turbulence of my broken marriage, helps me reach for ideas, yet empties my mind, brings me closer to both life and death. I don't know why. But it does. Thank you, Deborah. I think we'll have to leave it there because I'm aware that you guys have to go and introduce um, this film happening. So hopefully you're all sticking around. I think that's at 8.20 or maybe a couple minutes. I don't know if they'll start a little bit late. But thank you all for coming. Thank, thank you. you to Deborah and Marie. Thank you, Mathias and the Institut Français. And have a lovely evening. Merci.